life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sunday of the Dead. Marshall. And Lainey are here, but Corey is not. No. Not today. It's going to be just the two of us talking about Season 2, Episode 9, Trigger Finger. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, this is kind of continuing in the trend of the last couple episodes, where there's a lot of high drama, but a lot of continuity errors and a lot of cuts that Mm. don't necessarily make sense. Right. Small little scenes that are like 30, 40 seconds before we go back to the other action. So, it was really hard to uh, watch this episode while making notes because it was like, and then it's something else, and then it's something else, and then it's something else. So Mm -hmm. bear with us. It might seem a little chaotic in this episode, but let's jump off. This episode originally aired on AMC in the United States on February 19th, 2012. It was watched by an estimated 6.89 million viewers, down from the previous episode, which reached 8.10 8.10 million viewers. So it took a significant drop, and probably because, as we talked about in our last episode, people were tuning in to see what happened to Sophia, and we got no answers. So yeah. they were like, ah, forget it. <laughs> I'm out. Um, this episode was directed by Billy Gearhart. Yes. We open this episode on the road where Lori has done a foolish thing. And taken the car out, flipped it, and is now in the car with a zombie trying to eat through the windshield. Yeah, it's trying to push its face through the one hole that's in the windshield. And it's like... (laughs) But we're not going to continue with that for a while. No, we're not. Uh, I would like to say that in this situation, Lori is very headstrong. But she's not always smart. Hmm. When she does her thing. She rules by emotion a Mm -hmm. lot of the time. But let's go to where we really want to be, and that's the bar. At the end of Nebraska, Rick guns down uh, Dave and Tony, which are two thugs from Philadelphia, and it's bright light outside at the time that he shoots them down in the previous episode. But now, it's dark. And the shot's... You can hear them, they shoot them all over again. Right. Which is saying, oh, uh, little retcon, it's now evening, okay? Okay. It's like the DM in between sessions just forgot what was going on and decided, I'm going to change things up. So the funny thing about this whole situation is that Herschel doesn't really seem to be super upset about Rick gutting down these guys. He is starting to come around to the reality of what the situation really is, and he doesn't really seem to be judgmental about what Rick has done. In fact, he almost is a little impressed that Rick did what he did to protect Herschel's livelihood, his farm, his family. And I think Herschel at that moment realized that Rick is someone he can trust to be on his side and do what needs to be done. Even though there's still no guarantees that Rick and company are going to be allowed to stay. Correct. So they decide to go back to the farm. So Rick takes all the guns and ammo off Dave and Tony. And then they hear a car approaching. And there are three guys walking around outside talking about how they're trying to find Dave and Tony, where they went, etc. So now this might escalate to yet another thing that's happening. But then we go over... Back to Lori. Uh, so, this is really gross. <laughs> yup. When this walker is putting his head through the windshield, you can, like, see the skin, like, peeling back on the glass. It is just so disgusting. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to watch. That's that, Even though it's dead, it, it's like, ah. And it, the prosthetic job was just far too good. It was good. very good. Very it's far good. too good. Lori tries to escape out the back uh, back seat, like climbing over, but the walker grabs the back of her. So she 
she's kind of like she comes over and she's like looking in the in the glove box apparently and she grabs something and i tried to figure out what it was she grabbed because she sticks it in the zombie's eye and there is this big thing on the end of it like kind of a plastic knob and like a cover on the end of it and i couldn't figure out if it was a screwdriver or what it was well what i actually saw her do she r- did root around in the glove box didn't find anything and then she reached over for something that's in the console and yanks it out i think it's actually the um the the lever for your turn, the turn signal. signal see that makes a lot more sense to me because of how it was uh, shaped at first I was like why is she putting a big thermometer in his eye <laughs> because that makes no sense let me either. take your temperature <laughs> so yay she uh she gets out of the car and she's just looking at the car like <laughs> and she's not being very smart because along comes another zombie behind her and grabs her so she reaches down and grabs the hubcap that's on the ground and like hits him in the face but As we all know, that's not really going to do anything. She does see the gun in the back of the car. So she goes back in, gets the gun, and then goes to shoot the walker. Finally in the face. And then we leave that scene. And what she does in the intervening time kind of makes me even further angry with what she's doing. But we're going to get there, too. Right. At the farm, they're having kind of a family meal, kind of. Uh, Dale, Andrea, Shane, T-Dog, Carl, Patricia, Carol, Maggie, and Jimmy are all having this meal. Beth is in shock in bed. Daryl is not there. Uh, We will find out where he is later. And Carol says that she looked for Lori and didn't know where she was. And Maggie said, well, she isn't here. So then they all decide they're all going to go look for her and figure out where she went. I'm just going to search around everywhere. And again, this is kind of a useless scene in a way. It is, but I don't also don't think it is. Because I thought it was a really interesting nod to the fact that they are still coming together. Even though their quote unquote leaders are not there. Herschel's not there. Mm. Rick's not there. Uh, Shane is there, but you know... I don't think he's the one who facilitated the community time. No. I'm pretty sure that the people who did this were Maggie, Patricia, probably T-Dog, maybe Andrea. Um, Those people probably tried to bring it all together and say, hey, let's eat. Maybe even Dale. I I, I would say Carol is probably one of the primary people that's going to try and bring people together. Carol Mm -hmm. and T-Dog. Right. Like T-Dog probably came up with the idea, but Carol is the one that actually made it happen. Right. Exactly. So they're all going to go search for her, but we're going back to the bar. So they are ducked down under the windows next to the front door, and they're trying to see if the coast is clear, and it's not. (laughs) It's really not. Um, The guys just won't leave. Uh, So they decide to go out the back when they hear gunshots, which is the guys shooting the zombies. Mm -hmm. So they can obviously see there are three guys out there, and uh, those guys are saying, oh, well, did you check the bar? Oh, you should have checked the bar because, you know, Dave and Tony are going to be in the bar. So they go to try to get in the bar when Glenn basically slams the door back shut and, like, sits in front of it so they can't get in. And and then the guys are kind of like, well, okay, maybe there's somebody in there. Uh, Okay, well, I I, I don't know. Well, maybe there's somebody. I don't know. And they just kind of mope around outside for a little while without making too much sense until finally Rick uh, just yells out, they drew on us. And it's, seriously, why would he do this? Like, <laughs> well, they were about to walk away. Like, really, Rick? Why would you do this? And then Herschel kind of looks at him for a moment with the same expression. just like, why did you do that? Oh, this is going to be terrible. <laughs> then they say something like, they can't tell Jane. And I'm like, who is this Jane? Do we ever meet her later? I was just like... I don't know. I made a note of it just in case we did. But in this episode, we did not hear anything more about Jane. I don't I don't know if this group ever shows up again. Um, not in their entirety. Right. Um, but I'm willing to bet that Jane was like Tony's girlfriend. Right. Or wife. Yeah, something like that. We don't like see that. a ring on his finger. So I don't think it's wife. But, right. Yeah. So Rick tries to reason with these guys. And they just decide they're going to shoot out the window above Glenn. 
Uh, they all run, like Herschel and Glenn try to run toward the back part and on the wall there are a bunch of burlesque pictures basically of some women and a poster for Geo Winter Bach beer. So I got into a really nice search about this particular poster and if it was for a real beer company or if it was just like a print. From everything that I can tell, this is a print, but I couldn't necessarily find that this place did exist. However, on the poster, it says Geo Winter Brewing Company, Bach Beer, Brewery, 55th Street, between uh, two, oh, 2nd and 3rd Avenue, New York, Louis Kramer, New York. So it seems to be a mass printed poster that was created around the 1900s. So that's how old it is, which is wow. pretty cool. I did a search um, for things on 55th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, and here are a few things I found that are currently there. PJ Clark's, which is a restaurant, uh, Tufenkian Carpets, I'm guessing they sell or clean carpets, maybe both. There's a parking garage, that's fun. And Good Nature Deli, which has a lot of really good reviews, apparently, so some interesting things there. Okay. Uh, again, I couldn't really find if it if this place had ever really existed there, so it's still a cool detail. Yeah. So Herschel slides the shotgun to Glenn, and I thought it was really interesting because there's this look on Glenn's face like, "You giving this to me?" Like, a, I I don't know that I can do this, and B, you trust me with the shotgun? And you're just running around with pistols? Like, you know, I'm with your daughter? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that kind of thing? Um, it was kind of funny. And then the look on Herschel's face was just kind of like, you got this. Mm -hmm. You're good. I thought it was a really, really nice moment that, that happened with between the two of them. And then all of a sudden, the shots stop. And now we're back in the forest with Daryl, who is the one person who knows where Lori is, really. So he's by the fire, and Carol runs up and says, um, we can't find Lori. And Zero says, well, Lori asked him to go get Rick, and he said no. So Lori did it herself. And Carol's like, why didn't you say anything? Seriously. Mm -hmm. And Daryl has this look on his face like, uh, oh. I guess I, I, I didn't really think that she would just be an idiot. Y yeah, so either he he's like... I made a mistake or he's too stubborn to think he made a mistake because, you know, he's had that child temper tantrum for the past day or so. Um, so Carol sees that there's a tent and that Daryl is basically camping out in the forest by himself to be away from everybody else. And Carol says, can you just not separate yourself? This is not, don't do this. Don't separate yourself from everybody. It's almost like he's trying to punish himself in a way I, I feel like this is also him realizing that he's having a temper tantrum and unlike a lot of other people he decides that he's not going to try he's gonna actively not take it out on everybody else so he separates himself from the group even if he does take it out on other people but he only takes it out on the people that come and find him exactly Mm -hmm. At the RV camp, Carol tells the group that she had asked Daryl, that Lori, sorry, Carol, Carol said, sorry, there are far too many pronouns. Carol tells the group that Lori asked Daryl to go into town, but he said no, so she probably went by herself. So Shane gets ticked because he's Shane. Yeah. <laughs> and he thinks Lori is his property to protect or something. And he goes after her. And he, he takes a moment and goes to Dale and he's like, did she take a gun? And Dale kind of looks at him like, how am I supposed to know? Why? Because just a few hours earlier, Shane had, well, not a few hours, but earlier on in that day, Shane ran around giving everybody guns. Right. He handed out the guns to every single person in an attempt to stage a coup. And now the genie's out of the bottle. How is Dale going to keep control of anything when you took that control away from him? Exactly. So we return to the bar and Rick starts yelling at the guy outside. But it sounds like they that something is happening in the back part of the bar. So Glenn goes to check the back. And it's kind of an interesting setup that 
there are some stairs that lead down into the cellar area. He can hear people out the back part of the door. So he goes up to the door and there's this really good shot of the doorknob starting to turn. And you can see an A etched on this doorknob. Yeah, it's like in in long scratches. Yeah. There's a few other scratches on there, but the A is very prominent. Very. And I, I kind of had stumbled across the fact that there would be an A on this doorknob while I was doing other research. So I knew it was coming. But then once I started doing research about why... It seems like I missed a very large component of hidden things in this show where the A pops up quite a lot. Um, In The Walking Dead World Beyond, it refers to zombies being studied by the Civic Republic. If you remember um, in like towards the end of this show, right before Rick leaves the show, they talk about are you an A or a B when it comes to like CRM. Uh, that whole thing. Um, there's another theory that the letter A signifies when characters are trapped and have their humanity put to the test. So, guess what we're tracking, guys? We're going to track the letter A. I want to call it joining the A team. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, then Glenn shoots out the back door. And we're back with Lori. <laughs> Well, kind of, because Shane is trying to find her, and he's going down the road, and he finds her wreck, but she's nowhere near it. Right. She just started walking, not back home, towards the problem. Well, yeah, so he finds the car and and some dead zombies, and he's like, okay. (laughs) So he goes trying to find her. Mm -hmm. But then, let's go back to the bar. (laughs) I'm serious. That scene was only, uh, if if I'm tracking it correctly, like 40 seconds long (laughs) for Shane to drive up. Okay. At the bar, Rick and Herschel are in the front part of the bar, and Rick says for him, for Herschel to cover Glenn and have him pull the car along the back. And, uh... And then Rick says to Herschel, this would have been a really good opportunity for you to use that gun training you didn't have, basically, was what mm-hmm. he was saying. And Herschel's like, I can shoot. I just don't like to. <laughs> so, Rick, you you think he's on the farm and he doesn't know how to shoot? I Most people I know who have farms need to know how to shoot. Yeah. For various reasons. Dealing with predators, mm-hmm. dealing with people that just want to be jerks. Um, yep. Yeah. Dealing exactly. with tax auditors. Yes, that too. Yeah. So once again, Glenn is the speedy bait, as I call him. Uh, so he has to go get the car. Uh, and he's like, no, fine, fine, I'll go get the car. So Herschel's at the back door with Glenn, and Glenn runs off. And Herschel shoots one of the guys. Guess what? Herschel has joined the Kill Shot Club. Kind of. Like, he shoots him, but the guy is still alive. Um, yeah, yeah, but... It's same, not going to be for very long. No, that's how we counted Otis also. So he's part of it. Yeah. And the thing is, what's making his wife even worse for him, he's now been shot. It's not a lethal shot. It's a shot to the chest. Mm-hmm. But he's like, ah, ah, and he's yelling and moaning and yeah. screaming like a little baby. And I'm like, dude, it's only a bullet to the gut. Walk it off, my man. Yeah. So let's talk but, about this guy named Sean, who you literally only see for a couple seconds. His name is Kedar Whittle. And he once once on One Tree Hill. That's basically what we know him from at this point. Um, I didn't see a whole bunch of things that I knew him from before, but he's been in some other things. But yes, I, I totally think this this made Herschel join very quickly the Kill Shot Club because yes, he didn't totally kill him, but he was the one who was responsible for his death. Mm -hmm. Same as Shane. Maybe his intentions were not the same, but that is what happened to Otis. And we also have to take a look at these people who have just entered that club have done so in the defense of others. Mm -hmm. As opposed to Shane that did it in the defense of him himself and his pride. Correct. Rick comes up and Herschel says that Glenn must have been hit because he can see his legs kind of like shooting out from the dumpster. And at this point, I went, oh, my gosh, Glenn and the dumpster, because mm-hmm. <laughs> Glenn does not have a good time with dumpsters. But yeah, every time he's around a dumpster, he survives the situation. Yes. It's just 
makes everybody think he didn't. Exactly. <laughs> Which is, is funny. But really, Glenn is not hit. He's just sitting there, freezing up. Mm-hmm. So Rick kind of goes over there and helps Glenn continue on. There are shots fired from the top of Steve's pharmacy, and then a car rolls up. So in the car is uh, Nate, but his his real name is Philip Devona. He was on an episode of Cobra Kai, and you can barely see him in the car. Like, barely see him. Um, he was also on a TV series called Star, uh, and that's all I got about him. But on the roof is Randall, which we will come to know very well, I think, in the next episode. His name is Michael Zegan. He was previously on The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I believe he was Mr. Maisel. And from what Corey says, I've seen it a couple times and he looks vaguely familiar to me. And he was also on Boardwalk Empire. So he has a very large body of work as well when he gets older. But Randall is definitely going to be the one of this group of guys that we will get to know a lot better. And which is why I really wish that he and the actor for uh, for Tony switched places. Mm-hmm. Because Tony's actor has a lot more going on right. with what he can I do. I think it was an age thing. I think Randall, yeah. because he's younger, that's why they had happened what happened. So Randall goes to jump to get in the car. Like, to get down to the car. And uh, he hits the roof and rolls off. Mm -hmm. And Nate is like, nope, I gotta go. Bye. So he drives the car away. And you hear Randall screaming. Bloody murder. He's definitely hurt. And then you hear Sean still screaming as he's being eaten by walkers in the face. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They, like, chew off his nose. It's gross. Yeah. This is a gross episode. It, it, it is kind of a gross episode. But now we can see Nate is the only person that survives of this group of marauders. Of five guys, yeah. But, like... Well, that's not so- true. Randall's still alive. Well, okay. Yeah. He's the only one to leave without, without right. injury. Mm-hmm. And he did so because he's a coward. Yes, exactly. Now, Herschel says the gunfire must have attracted the walkers. This is the first time we ever hear Herschel use that term. In fact, before, when Maggie says walkers, Herschel's like, I don't like you using that word. But now he's using that word. Either because they just don't, they, they haven't quite dealt with that in the writer's room or because he has finally come to that term. I think that's it. I think yeah. he's finally understood what is happening. Mm-hmm. That they're not people. And I think he said something like that in the earlier episode. Randall, poor Randall, has landed on the spikes of a gate. It goes up through his leg. Now, these are interesting spikes because they form an arrow on the top. So once your leg has gone through, it can't really come back up because it's being caught by the top part of the arrow. Yeah, because the arrow sweeps out. It, it's, it doesn't have a, a neat arrow head yeah. that then gives you a wedge to come back up on. It's like an umbrella arrow. That's kind of like yeah, what it is because it comes yeah. out. It's so gross. <laughs> um, then uh, they all come over, um, Rick and Herschel and Glenn all come over and they're like, okay, what should we do? Should we just amputate the leg? Should we rip it off? Should we leave him here? Should we just kill him? What should we do? And as we've said, it's very hard to get that leg off there, you know, with keeping his muscles intact because of that umbrella point. Um, So they decide they're going to try to amputate it with a knife Without any <laughs> anesthesia, obviously. Right. And Randall's yelling, and all of a sudden he's, you know, his yelling brings all the walkers to the yard. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. kind of want to bring up at this point that, you know, the all these walkers are coming out, out of the woodworks, all over the place. And up to this point, this area, which is the same area as a convenience store, has always been safe. There's been, like, one walker we've seen so far, really. Mm-hmm. So... I feel like it was only safe because when Maggie was constantly coming, she was fast and she was quiet. Right. She used a horse Mm -hmm. instead of a car, which is a lot quieter. Mm -hmm. She's not screaming bloody murder. She's not shooting things. Yeah. (laughs) All of these things are noisy. Yeah. And so, like, basically being around too long and making too much noise brings out all the spooks. Right. Especially now that Glenn and Rick are laying down fire trying to... uh, keep the walkers away from Herschel who's trying to cut off 
this guy's leg with a knife. Also, this scene. Uh, so what's really interesting about Herschel cutting off the leg is I feel like this was very foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. Because later on, spoilers, uh, he does get bitten. Mm -hmm. And we do learn that there's a way that you can save yourself if you get bitten. And that's by cutting off any limbs before it, you start getting more infected. And that is what happens to Herschel later on. That was kind of like our big aha moment when it, when it comes to that, because you think, oh, they're going to die. Mm -hmm. But this is very foreshadowing because Herschel loses his leg later and here he is performing an amputation. Now, remember, he's a vet. Mm -hmm. He's not a doctor, but he has knowledge, okay? Yeah, he knows how to amputate. He knows how to repair anything. Mm -hmm. But he cannot do this. He cannot do this with Not the knife. Not in this circumstance. No. no. So Rick basically just does what <laughs> you don't want him to do, which is pull that leg up and over that spike. Oh, so gross. <laughs> and there's like blood flying everywhere. It was, it was, it's not fun to be around that. Now, in this case, we go back to the road and I'm okay with it because I just needed a break from all of that carnage. Like we didn't need the previous shot of Shane finding her. But this shot was kind of necessary because it's where he finds her. Um, and so she's just walking along the road. He rolls up. When she when he talks to her, he tells her, yeah, and he, he does this really poorly. She He's like, oh, yeah, they're back at home. Everybody's back at home. We're all just waiting on you. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. And he can't even really look at her while he's saying it. Yeah. And he has this hesitation every time he talks. He knows it's not true, and he knows that somebody's going to see through him, and he knows that this is going to have a bad consequence later. It really is. Mm -hmm. What's really weird next is that we're back in the forest with Daryl, and so Carol has basically come from talking to Daryl, back to the RV camp to tell everyone what was going on, and then back to Daryl. But he's not here, though, that she can see, and he is. she's kind of looking at, like, things that has been strung up to dry lots of woodland creatures and then the very last item there is his necklace of undead hearing the uh all those walker ears that he's strung up mm -hmm. he's got them out drawing too <laughs> i just think it's his, his jewelry yeah. jewelry box between the trees or something <laughs> um, he's also being really mean and blaming carol for sophia being missing it's like okay daryl where were you when Sophia ran off? Because Carol was under the car and Sophia runs and Daryl, what was he doing? Oh, he was going to save T-Dog. But Carol couldn't get to Sophia. So he needs to back off. Okay, back off. If he should be mad at anyone, it should be Rick. But even then, no. But he shouldn't be mad at Carol, of all people, for mm. what happened to Sophia. But she is really used to being yelled at from Ed. Mm -hmm. So she's just taken it. She's, she's like, in her mind, I think she's saying, I know I have a child and I had a childish husband. I know what you're doing. Go ahead. I know you're just throwing a tantrum right now. Go, go ahead and yell at me. I can take it. I'm just going to stand here and look at you. And he, like, gets up in her face and just wah. And it's very reminiscent of what Shane did in the last episode with Dale. Mm. Where Shane was like, you blah, 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 blah. And Dale just stood there and said nothing. It was kind of the same situation in this case. Yeah. I kind of see this scene in a very different light. Especially because of how Carol is just standing there and looking at him. But, like, I, I see this as him actually airing his own guilt. Everything he says to Carol is actually true of himself. Mm. And he doesn't have a family of his own anymore. Which is what he says to her. Right. Um, he lost his brother. He lost his parents. Um, so he, make, he made Sophia a surrogate for his missing brother. He went out searching for her the way that he felt like he wanted to do for his own brother right. but couldn't because they moved on um he couldn't find her he couldn't protect her he hates himself for it so he tries to convince himself that this isn't his responsibility and tries to relieve his own guilt but inside sophia was like a niece she is family maybe mm -hmm. not direct blood family but she's family right um, and so carol kind of detects this and rather than getting defensive or talking him down trying to you know 
ease his suffering she just stands there and becomes a mirror as the conversation goes on he's kind of watching her and he sees in her the things that he did for her when he was trying to reassure her when he gave her the Cherokee Rose he was giving her the strength to keep on going mm -hmm. so now every time he's saying something he looks at her and it's like she's saying back to him but you were there for me every failing you see in yourself I say the opposite right and you get to the end of that conversation and he's like he can't say anymore like the last bits of it are like petering out yeah and then they just look at each other <laughs> for a while and it's like these characters are a master class in subtle conversation uh -huh. because there is another layer to everything that they're saying mm -hmm. i feel beautiful. like you're you're you've hit the nail on the head because it's just such a complex situation when it comes to these two and i think that that is really an indication of why people like these characters so much is because of the complexity of where they are. Whereas if you look at, you know, maybe Andrea or Shane who are having a temper tantrum as well, people are not as down with that temper tantrum because they're like, you're being ridiculous. Those but, characters are very surface level. Right. But Daryl, on the other hand, is having a tantrum and you're like, man, I understand where you are coming from. I get it. Yes, you're complaining, but I like your intentions of where it comes from yeah. and the complexity. So I think that's a, a very good point. That This portion right here makes a lot of the downfalls of this episode worthwhile. Mm -hmm. But we do return to the farm when we see that Shane is, has Lori in the car. And uh, they get up, get out of the car, and Lori notices that Rick is not around. And she goes, well, where is he? And then you see Shane, Shane's face like, uh, oh, yep. Here it is. Like, he has his back to her as he's walking away, and you can see his face just all of a sudden, like, this is gonna yeah. hurt. <laughs> and then they talk about the fact that he's not there, isn't back yet, they're having an argument, and Shane literally outs Lori's pregnancy to everyone. Including little Carl, <laughs> who didn't know. No, he did not know. Because only really a couple people knew at this point. And uh, most of the people there did not know. Maggie knew. And you could see on Maggie's face, she was like, I knew that. I knew this. Because she helped Glenn mm -hmm. get the stuff and knew who it was for. But I think the look on Maggie's face was more of the, oh, she didn't take the pills. That she could have taken. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dale takes control of the situation and is like, let's go take care of you, Lori. And... Um, then it looks like Maggie, who was outside before, is now next to Beth's bed. So there's like a really interesting time jump here in the same scene. It was kind of like, ba-bam. Yeah, they, they just didn't bother to put another scene in between. Exactly. So Lori, Carl, and Dale are in the living room with Andrea. And they're talking about the pregnancy and whatever. And Carl is just super chill about the whole thing. He's like, cool. I'm going to be a big brother. Awesome. Um, and then Lori says that they never had the talk with Carl about how babies are made. And Dale's face is like, what? You're going to you're gonna do this now? But in the meantime, Andrea <laughs> kind of looks back like, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> so then Carl looks at Dale, of all people, like for an explanation. And Dale's like, nope, I'm not your father. Nope. <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> it was. I thought this was a hysterical scene. Yeah, it I was, was actually laughing. Um, and then Carl says that he's like, "Can we name her Sophia?" Sorry, dude. Sorry, dude. Her name's Judith. And actually, I did a quick dive into the meaning of those names. Um, Sophia uh, is a Latin word meaning wisdom. Um, as we know, characters of true wisdom in the show do not last long. No, they don't. Just like she didn't. Um, Judith literally means woman of Judea, but it also means she will be praised. Yes. And she will be praised. She will. <laughs> uh, and then Carl goes, I'm going to be big brother Carl. It's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> and he does it like with a little tip of the hat, like I'm a cowboy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then Shane comes in and Lori looks like she basically wants to kill Shane. 
And Andrea's like trying to deflect the whole thing, like, oh, it's okay, you know, let's not don't go there. But then Shane tries to explain why he lied. And Lori is like, I'm tired of all the lies. You know, aren't we all aren't yeah. we all tired of all the lies, Shane? Um, and then Lori actually brings up Otis, which Shane knew that Dale knew, mm-hmm. but didn't know that Dale had told Lori. Mm-hmm. Is this high school? He said, she said. Yeah. Yeah, so he's like, uh, okay, how do I get out of this situation? So then Lori says that she told Rick about the relationship they had, and Shane is, like, shocked again because she didn't, he didn't think that she would actually tell him. Okay. And the weird monster that's inside of him starts brewing again. You can almost see it. Mm-hmm. And you can also see, like, he's got a lot of fear in his look. I think it's – he's confused – I think there's a confusion there because if Rick knows, why didn't Rick come and confront him? Why doesn't he have this scene where he fought Rick over the baby? He was expecting to fight Rick for Lori if he found out. Mm-hmm. But Rick hasn't done anything. That's because Rick is understanding mm-hmm. and under- and understood what Lori was thinking. Like, oh, Lori wanted a connection to somebody and needed a connection, and Shane was the most logical choice because they've known each other forever. Yeah. Shane also says that their thing was a long time coming. And uh, this is, like, starting to get really stalkery and weird. Yeah, it, he starts denying reality now. Yeah. He, he also is denying that she has feelings that he doesn't. And he has feelings that she doesn't. Right. It's a breakdown of sapience yeah. that he's having right now and is isolating his own feelings into his own reality. Mm-hmm. It's the next morning on the farm and Andrea comes in to check on Maggie, Patricia and Beth who are in that bedroom downstairs. And Beth is just laying there with her eyes open and Patricia is going to set up an IV. And I think this is a really sweet moment because... Andrea really relates to Maggie and Beth's connection because of Amy Mm -hmm. and knows what it's like to be an older sister trying to protect a younger sister. Maggie tells this really cute story about uh, birth control and how she had some in her bag and that Beth had found it and like ran down in her Sunday church dress to the lake and like started throwing stuff in and then they were all messing around like the three of them with their brother Sean and um, how Herschel comes in and is like what's going on and they're like oh we're just playing around or whatever yeah and and Beth is just like oh we're just swimming daddy but this is the sweetest voice. This is a really fun story. Mm-hmm. And I, if you guys aren't watching the episodes, just go in and listen to this. This is a really sweet story. It is. But this also kind of does cement Beth as the replacement for Amy. Yeah, a little bit. And Beth, you know, once she breaks out of this shock that she's in, which, okay, I understand. I understand why Beth is in shock, but I also think it's a little overkill. At this part, because I think it really solidifies that she was on board 100% with what her dad was saying. Yeah. And she didn't question any other way. So to her, her parents or her, her brother and her mom were not dead before. And now they just got murdered, basically, mm-hmm. by these people. And uh, for us, looking from the outside in, we're like, but they were already dead they were already dead, Beth. Like, you know? But she had all this hope that was just shattered. Right. And a whole future that she was seeing that isn't there anymore. Yes. The outside, though, Shane, T-Dog, Andrea, and Daryl, who all of a sudden is like, hey, I'm here to help now, guys. Let's go do this. Like, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now? <laughs> um, so they're all outside next to the car, packing it up, talking about how they're going to go look for Rick and Herschel. Dale thinks Shane doesn't want to find them so he can be the big dog for the group. So he says this to Andrea that that she needs to be careful because Shane is basically putting on a false facade of wanting to help. But, sh- but he doesn't want them found because he wants to be the leader. And then Andrea says that Shane has done more for Rick than the group. And we are, it's very easy for us to be like, really, Andrea, are you going to be like that? 
but we have only seen a small snippet of their life. Uh, we kind of still don't know the exact length of time that this is going on, but it's over a little over a week, probably, that we've been watching this group mm -hmm. between these two seasons. There was a whole month that they were together at the beginning of the series before we had ever started seeing them. Right. So there's very likely things that he did to keep the group safe before Rick showed up. Mm -hmm. But the other half of this is that uh, Andrea kind of sympathizes with Shane's Machiavellian tendencies. Mm -hmm. This let's just get the job done mentality. Right. And that's why she sees that, yeah, he does more for Rick's, more than Rick can do because Rick is limited by morality. Right. Something else to bring up here is that Daryl is wearing the iconic leather angel wings vest. Uh, and he has worn it before briefly once. From here on out, he is going to be permanently wearing this leather jacket. And I find this interesting that this was where he chose to do it. It was almost like he came out of his, you know, childish tantrum and he becomes, a, in, in a sense, a savior protector um, of people while wearing this vest. He wasn't worthy of it before, but maybe he can be now. Yeah. And this is also the point in the story where he starts to come out of the feral Daryl mentality right and becomes the the rough rider right effectively um also you can tell like they expect this to be a big thing because before we even see his face the shot focuses on that jacket mm -hmm. and then he turns around and you see that it's daryl right so they're like yeah we're gonna make sure that this is important mm. So this car, another car rolls up with Rick, Herschel, Glenn, and Randall. Um, everyone comes out to meet the car. Maggie comes running up. I was laughing so hard. I was laughing so hard I had to stop the video. Maggie comes running up and you think she's going to go hug Herschel, but he, she goes right past Herschel to Glenn and Herschel's like, what? Wait, what about me, daughter? <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> um, T-Dog points at Randall and says, who is that? Now, here's a continuity error. If you look when the car rolls up, you can plainly see that Randall is in the back seat with Glenn not wearing a blindfold. But when T Dog points to him and it cuts over to Randall in the car, he is wearing a blindfold. Yeah. That's a kind of a huge continuity error that didn't it, happen. It's there. a large plot point that doesn't Very make sense. Very much, yeah. yeah. Now they're inside the farmhouse and Rick is explaining the situation of what happened and they are discussing what they're going to do about Randall. Some people want to just send him back, but other people are like, well, they're afraid because he's just going to lead the people back here because how they he's obviously seen. I mean, he wasn't really wearing a blindfold when they rolled up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he knows where they are. Uh, but then other people are like, oh, well, we can't kill him because, you know, then we're no better than everybody else. But really, you just killed everybody else in their group. So whatever. In self-defense. Right. Uh, so Shane is super sarcastic and he says, look at this, folks. We back in fantasy land. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, Herschel is mad and basically tells Shane to zip it. Mm -hmm. Don't want to hear your stuff anymore. And Shane just has no response to that. He's just like, uh, and he turns around and leaves. Yeah. And like Herschel is throwing all of Shane's downfalls in his face right here. But then when you turn and you see the rest of the group, everybody, we can't see Andrea, but literally everybody else in the room is looking at Shane. Like if you do anything, I'm coming after you. Mm hmm. And if you look down at Carl, he is looking over his shoulder at Shane. And the look in his eye is, if I had a gun, I'd just shoot you. Wow. I missed that, but that's amazing. Like, he, he is about ready to throw down with mm -hmm. Shane. Right. So that's possibly one of the reasons why Shane backed down, is he can see that nobody is on his side right, right. now. Right. There are a lot of unspoken conversations as they start to break up a little bit. Uh, Herschel and Rick have this like mutual agreement look like we're on the same side now. We, we know what, what we're doing. Um, Maggie kind of looks at Glenn and is like, why is he so, what's wrong? Like, what is wrong with him? Uh, Daryl glares at Carol and leaves. So he was all, like, happy-go-lucky about going to go rescue Rick and Herschel, but he's still mad at Carol. 
Like, really, Daryl? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. So then Maggie goes up and asks what what is going on with Glenn. What is wrong? And he says he's frustrated because instead of standing up and protecting Rick and Herschel, he hid. And he said the one thought that made him think this is that Maggie wouldn't have him anymore. And that because she said that she loved him would hurt her. Mm -hmm. If he was gone, which I I think she proved by running up and hugging him before her dad. Um, But he said that it was he he didn't like this because he thought he was being selfish. And I went, Glenn, you're not being selfish in this moment. You're actually being unselfish because you're thinking, where are my priorities? And you're thinking of Maggie. You're not thinking of yourself. Yeah. So if you were thinking of yourself, you probably would think, oh, I need to be the hero in the situation for me because I feel good or whatever. But in this situation, you're actually thinking about how other people would feel. That is not selfish. Yeah. And it's just something that he kind of has to get over. But she's shocked by it because when she's hearing him describe it, she's touched. Mm -hmm. This is up until the point that he's like, I can't do this because it makes me feel selfish. Up until the point that he said that, she was taking this as the greatest declaration of love she could ever have. Mm -hmm. And then he says that he can't do it because he feels selfish. And then she's like, that that makes no sense. (laughs) It's hard. It's his first real love, you know? Yeah. In Beth's room, Herschel is taking her vitals, and it looks like his watch says 450. Confirmed. All right. So then Maggie goes off on Herschel like, you were drinking and then you left? Really? Two things? Two bad things, Dad. Two. Mm-hmm. That's why I didn't hug you when I came out of the house. No, I don't know if she didn't <laughs> <Probably> say that. <laughs> really. Um, in the yard, Shane and Andrea are going towards the barn to watch Randall. Uh, and then Andrea talks to Shane about the fact that, you know, what he's saying is right, but he needs to dust off his presentation because it's a little... You know, hostile. And I'm thinking, does she really have anywhere to talk in this situation? Because, let's be honest, she doesn't have the greatest presentation either. No, she really doesn't. Uh, honestly, though, I, I give her credit for this. I give her some, some serious points because she is going up to him and she knows how he thinks. Mm-hmm. If you go up and tell him he's wrong, he's going to get his heckles up and he's going to fight you. Right. But if you go up and you go, Hey, you know what? You're saying some right things. You're you're making a lot of sense. I think though you might need to work on how you're bringing it across. That's a good way of cooling him off a little right. bit yeah. and trying to get him to not escalate the situation. Right, correct. Which is where all the problem is. So I, I say it's like uh, she sees that he's a powder keg, but instead of lighting the fuse like everybody else, she just tries to roll the powder keg away. And he he says to her that you know maybe the two of them should have just left together. Mm, yes. And we are all th- saying. Yeah, probably should have. Yeah, probably should have. I mean, right now, yes. Uh, Shane with Andrea is just a bad situation. And once Shane is no longer with Andrea, she finally starts to become a little more Mm even-keeled. She doesn't have that fire that burns within her. Yeah, she makes some weird decisions still. But I think it's really who it is that she connects with. And later on... She's friends with Michonne. And as we all know, Michonne is an amazing lady. So she, I think, really gets that from her, that strong but yet smart. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the RV camp, Lori and Rick are inside their tent. Uh, They both have injuries where it causes it uh, difficulty trying to get changed, which I thought was a a little funny part in this It's a nice little... um taste of home life in the zombie apocalypse. Right, it kind of is, yeah. Uh, Lori says that they need to talk about Shane because Shane thinks the baby is his, but she says, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The baby is yours. Even if it's not, it's yours. I don't care. It's not Shane's. And then she basically lays out everything that she should have told Rick from day one. This is what Shane thinks. This is what's happening now. Shane is scary Mm-hmm. He thinks that I'm his, that Carl is his. He's probably going to kill you to make that dream come true. All of that jazz. 
And Rick is kind of interesting because he understands where Shane is coming from, although not how he's acting it out, but he says, you kill the living to protect what's yours. And that is what has happened through this entire episode and yeah. last episode. You kill the living, Dave, Tony, Sean, to protect what's yours. I think that's a great way to just sum up this episode. But what gets me about this scene is how she does it. As you get closer to the end of the conversation, as she's whispering her own feelings and her predictions about what Shane is going to be like, she gets in right over his ear from behind him and starts whispering it to him. Mm -hmm. And it feels... I don't disagree with what she's doing. I think I think in general, telling him everything, letting him know what her fears are in right. this stage is going to keep everybody safe. Right. But the way that this is shot and the way that this is arranged makes it feel more like she's whispering dark thoughts into his ear. Especially when you then see the way that he looks. He's got a really creepy killer oh look gosh. on his face. He really does. And that's interesting that you should say that because... I did. I didn't see that at first. I thought this is a really interesting way that they uh, staged the shot so that you could see both of their faces. She's not like you don't see her profile turning her head into his ear. You can actually see both of their faces and both of their reactions as it goes. So that's interesting. But yeah, I didn't really make that connection that it, it looks like a manipulation. Yeah. Um, but you're right. At the end of this, after she says everything, Rick gets this really weird look on his face like I actually got chills I was mm -hmm. like this is this is very like like thriller book situation that I'm encountering with this yeah. look that he's giving you know I'm worried about what's happening I think when she did this it took Rick from being this guy who is I'm understanding to you step out of line, I'm going to take you out. Right. So if we talk about what Rick said, you killed the living to protect what's yours, and I might actually save that quote to put next to our Kill Club tally. And let's think about everyone who has killed the living to protect what's theirs. Technically, everyone has, mm -hmm. including Shane with Otis, because he thinks that by killing Otis, it's going to protect Carl so that he can get his stuff back so Carl's life is saved. Yes. So technically, they all have. Technically, yes. Yes. So I'm wondering if that trend is also going to continue on, but we will be tracking that as we go through the episodes as well. Uh, that is the end of the scenes. Let's talk about a couple other things. Uh, Herschel joining the Kill Club this, this episode by mm -hmm. killing Sean. Um, we did say that the clock said 450, his watch. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't really have any meaning here. has no meaning. It's it's not season four, episode 50, you know, or five. So it's or, probably literally 450 in the afternoon. Right. And uh, the name of this episode, Trigger Finger, is not as apparent as other episodes that we've had. Yeah. What do you think this means? I feel like this is... This is the point where there is an inciting incident that does kind of change everything and it's going to end in bloodshed. But this is the moment where something just shifts. And after a little while of thinking about it, there's actually two of them. One is the rescuing of Randall and the other one is this conversation between Rick and Lori. Mm. In this case, Lori is the trigger finger. Oh, okay. And... Randall is the other one in that saving him is going to bring about the fact that what's going to happen the rest of this season. Okay. I like this. We're going to go with that. Uh, so next week we are going to talk about uh, season two, episode 10, 18 miles out, which I don't know what that refers to at all. We're going to find yet, out. But we are going to find out. <laughs> Seems to be a jam-packed episode, I think, and just what I've seen ahead of time. So... We will see you then. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, 
please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out. Yeah.